Okay, let's pray to them and ask you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to speak to my life, that you'd minister to my heart. I ask that your word would be revealed to me today in a way that I can declare it and understand it and do it so that, I, so that it changes my life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're finishing the series today, Church, You Are the Center of the Universe. And today's sermon is entitled, God's Call is Irrevocable. So the fact that God calls you, it cannot be taken back. It cannot be canceled. But I wanted to just quickly recap from two weeks ago. Now, how many of you heard uh, Pastor Vicky's message last week? Amen. Amen. The woman caught in adultery, Ezekiel, and she somehow brought in the whole Bible in one sermon. And it made sense. Can we give her a big round of applause? That was awesome. All right, to use half the Bible, and it makes sense. <laughs> wow. Tell person next to you, say, wow. But anyway, from two weeks ago, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 to 23, and I very briefly want to recap. You can get it on, on Active TV. You can get the sermon. But, uh, you know, if you weren't just, I'd encourage you to listen. But this is, this is the church. And Paul said in Ephesians 1, starting at verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And so what I want you to understand, you are the inheritance of the richest person in the universe. And that is the Lord God Almighty. Everything that he owns is yours when you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then he goes on and he says this, <clears throat> And his incomparably great power for us who believe. So God has made a, a power available to us that is incomparable. You can't compare it. That power is the same mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule or authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked. Not only in the present age, but also the one to come. So Jesus is the authority above all authorities in this, the whole of this age, which means the past, the present, and the future. The past, the present, and the future is all one age. We're all a part of that age. He says not only in this age, not only does he rule the past, not only does he rule the present, not only does he rule the future, but in the age to come. In other words, Jesus' authority is so great, you cannot compare it to anyone. The power of the sun is nothing. The, all the forces in the universe are nothing compared to the authority that Jesus has. And then it says this, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. You are the reason that Jesus has all that authority. All that authority has been given to Jesus for you. Now I want to warn you, many people will say many things about what the church is, but the Bible says that the church is, is the gathering of the saints. The church is when we're having fellowship together. The church is when we're purposed together and we're united together. You can't go you and a tree and be the church. It doesn't mean wherever you go you, that the church is there. You're only part of the church if you're part of the gathering. And we're going to talk about that because the devil really attacked the church in 2020. So God placed everything under his feet. So everything's under the feet of Jesus and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So you are the body of Jesus. I am the body of Jesus. We are the body of Jesus. Something wrong there. Okay. I want you to really understand that when I say, church, you are the center of the universe. You literally are. You literally are the center of the universe. As a church, as a follower of Jesus, if you're saved, 
everything in the universe revolves around you. And when I say everything, I mean everything. But now what I want to tell you is that as a church, we have a responsibility. And the first part of that responsibility is to tell other people as a church about Jesus. Now, the, 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 the title of the sermon, as I said, is God's Call is Irrevocable. But I want to start off and I want to talk to you about the state of the world. In the next series we're going into, we're going to be looking at Romans 12. We're going to be looking at the state of the world. Because the, the reality is that most people do not understand the state of the world and they do not understand what is going on and why what is going on is going on. Now I want to start off with this. If you go to a site called Worldometer, I just want to check. There, there, there you can see. Now this I actually took this morning. I took it as close to the service as possible. So if you look at that, if you look at those figures now, they will have moved. But what it says is that 21 million... 637,321 people at the time when I took this, sna this, this screenshot had died from the 1st of January. So in 2021, up until today, 21,637,321 had died. This number is out of date. It's more than that now. So already when you look at that, that should tell you that... Um, <laughs> Maybe we need to take the gospel seriously. What, what I also want you to know, just under that, it said, now this was this morning at about 6 in the morning. 46,255 people had died today. Just let that sink in for a second. For us, it's still pretty early. Eh? And we're GMT plus 2 which means we're not even halfway on the time scale in the world. So very little of the day had passed when I took the screenshot and already 46,000 people had died. Today. But there's something even worse than that. And that is this next slide. And I don't know if you can see it, but... There have been 15,714,865 abortions this year. So 21 million people have died, but that's actually not how many people have died because every one of these abortions is a death. And almost as many abortions have happened as what people have died. 15,714,865 abortions this year. And this morning, it was 113,702 on this Sunday. There had been 113,702 abortions on this Sunday. Now, I, I, I want you to look at 40, 43, 43 million people have been infected with HIV. 618,000 have died because of AIDS. 3 million have died because of cancer. 145,000 have died because of malaria. Uh, 1.8 million, for those of you who smoke, 1.8 million of you died this, so far this year. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that one in there. All right, for those of you who drink, 920,060 deaths caused by alcohol this year. And for those of you thinking of committing suicide, well, 394,477 have already committed suicide this year. Now, look at those figures, and then 15 million people died before they were even born. And I want you to think about the state of the world and why it's in such a mess. Because let me tell you something, and if there's any woman here that's had an abortion, the blood of Jesus is available to you, and you need to speak to us because... You, you, you've already paid a price inside of yourself over having the abortion because you know that was your child. But, but what I want you to really think about is almost as many people are being killed in abortions as what are dying every single day and yet we freak out when someone speaks to us funny. I want you to think just for a second about how messed up the world is. That we kill almost as many people 
and it's not even called murder as people who die. And I want you to realize that every single thing that you know from the world is false. You live in a fake world, and in the next few weeks we're going to be looking at that. So I'm not going to go into that too much today. We live in a fake world where everything is deception. Everything is deception. And something that I've been saying for many years to people, everything you know before you know the Bible is wrong. Everything. I don't care what subject you're talking about, it's wrong. Unless you know Jesus, you do not know the truth. Now Romans chapter 11 verse 25 to 36, I want to read this to you quick and then we're going to go through it. Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full member of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. So in other words, he's saying, we're living in an age where the gospel has come to the Gentiles, where the Gentiles can be grafted into the, 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 the group that are called the people of God. So, so that's where we're at. And Israel's hearts have been hardened. And anyone that turns against God, God hardens their heart. But he says, it's only going to happen till enough of us Gentiles who were not born as Jews get saved. Then we're going to make them jealous. And they're going to come back. And then he goes on and he says this. In verse 27. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So we have a covenant where God takes away your sins. It doesn't matter what your sin is. It doesn't matter what you've messed up. It doesn't matter what you've broken. The blood of Jesus takes away your sins. This is the good news of the gospel. And then in verse 28 he says, As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. The, in other words, he's saying the people of Israel, the Jews, are loved because of guys like Abraham. And then he says, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. You know you got those gifts, you got them from God. And he will not revoke those gifts from you until you die. He will not revoke those gifts from you. And the calling that he has placed on your life as a Christian is irrevocable. No one can cancel the calling. It is permanent. It is there forever. And then it says this. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God and have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too might, may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. In other words, we got this faith from the Jews and they're going to get it from us and so none of us can brag. You see, you can't brag when you're before God. And then he goes on and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable is judgment and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? And I want you to listen to what this says. Who has known the mind of God? Who knows the mind of God? Who knows what God thinks? Now listen to what he says. Who has known the mind of the Lord or has been his counselor? How often have you tried to counsel God? You've tried to counsel God in terms of what He should be doing in your life. Maybe you've been angry with God because God hasn't done in your life what you wanted God to do in your life. And then it says, Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Now the answer is no one. You, you, you can never give to God. You can never match what God has given you. So when, you, when, you, when you're demanding stuff from God, remember he owes you nothing. And then it says, For from Him and through Him and for Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Now, this is what I want you to realize. You can know the mind of God through Jesus. And right now in the church, 
This is the big fight because things have come about in the world and the world has changed in such a way that you better realize that you can know the mind of God because if you don't know the mind of God, you're not going to be able to handle what the world's going to throw at you. Now, yeah, it's a big deal because we don't think like this. We don't process like this. But the reality is God's calling can never be removed from you. No single person can take the calling of God, the calling that God has on your life, away from you. And I don't care what sin you've committed, that calling remains. It's available to you. The calling of God is yours if you want it. The only way that you can lose the call of God on your life is if you take it and you throw it away. And many Christians take the call that God has on their life and they take it and they throw it away. You know, like a rugby pass. Only you can throw your calling away. No one else can touch it. In fact, I believe with all my heart that if you are following the calling of God until the purpose of God is fulfilled in your life, no one will be able to even kill you. Until God has finished. The moment God has finished, then He'll call you home. But if you are living and you know that you're living according to the will of God, if you die, you know it's because He's decided his purpose for your life, you've done what he wanted you to do. And all the rewards that he wants to give you when you get to heaven, they're already earned, basically. I want you to think about what Paul's also saying there. Why was everything made? Everything that exists, including you, including everyone you love, including the, the ground on which you, you find your house, the ground beneath this building, everything was made for God. And if everything was made for God, it was made for Jesus. The reason that we exist, the reason that we are here is for Jesus. If you don't know that, you do not know the purpose of your life. And God's purpose in allowing disobedience is in order that people might receive the mercy of God. He's given you a choice. You choose. Am I going to follow Jesus? Am I going to accept Him as my Lord and Savior? He's given you the choice. You are free to accept Him. You are free to experience the full redemption that comes through the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross. You, 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 you are free to receive all of the forgiveness that is available for all of that stuff you feel guilty about, all of the things that you regret. You are free to receive it, but you are free to reject it. You are, if I can put it this way, you are free to go to hell. You're entitled to go to hell if you want to. God didn't intend for you to go to hell. Hell was made for Satan and his demons according to Jesus. But if you want to go to hell, you have the choice. God loves you enough to give you the choice that you can choose to go there. Now, what is the important thing out of this? God loves people for His sake. God loves you for His sake. In other words, for God, He believes that He benefits out of loving you. Now, Romans eleven twenty eight 28 says, From your point of view, and this is from the message, just listen to how it puts it. From your point of view, as you hear and embrace the good news of the message, it looks like the Jews are God's enemies. So it says it looks like the Jews are God's enemies. But looked at from the long-range perspective of God's overall purpose, they remain God's oldest friends. Even though the Jews were a big part of crucifying Jesus, even though all of these things happened, the Jews still remain God's oldest friends. What do we learn from this? Well, you looked at the Jews in Jesus' day. They looked at the Gentiles as if they were the scum of the earth. So what is the lesson we need to take? We need to be careful before we judge others. We need to be careful before we judge others as the scum of the earth because we never know what God may be doing behind the scenes in a realm that we cannot see in those people's lives. Never write anyone off because of how much money they've got. Never write, write anyone off because of their lack of status. Never, never write anyone off because of what they've done. How many times do people do things and because they've done a certain thing or committed a certain sin, you in your wisdom have written them off and said, I will never ever associate with that person again. 
Every one of you has a sin in your mind where if someone did that sin, you will never associate with that person again. Maybe it's rape, child abuse. You know, maybe, maybe you're one of those that likes child abuse. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, now they call it pedophilia. It's, it's, it's people who love children. You know what I mean? And they're actually promoting that. So then maybe, maybe your greatest sin is to stop that love. But whatever it is, everyone has lines and then we judge people. But, but yeah, Paul is warning, listen, the Jews have done this to God, but they are God's oldest friends. God is not a man that he would give up on people. You will give up on people. I will give up on people. But God never gives up on anyone. I want you to think about the lengths that he went through for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. That's the lengths that he went through for us to be saved. And we need to be like him. He wants us to be like him, never giving up on people. It takes a tremendous amount of love to stay faithful to someone who's rejecting us. And I don't mean running after people and making an idiot of yourself. I'm not talking of that's not love. What, what I'm talking about is the fact that the, your door is always open. They know that your door is always open. They know that no matter what they've done to you, they can always come back. God is able to keep loving those that reject Him, and, and He actually does that. Every one of us has rejected God. In our lives, we've all taken turns to reject God. Every single one of us. There isn't a single one of us here that is innocent of that. Every sin that we committed, we rejected God. And relating to people, God is always looking at things from a long-range perspective. He's looking at me from a long-range perspective. He's looking at you from a long-range perspective. He's looking at the act of church from a long-range from a long range, uh, perspective. When you look at things from a long-range perspective, you come up with different views and, and different judgments. And here's the good news about this. Not even God will take the calling He placed on your life back. Not even God will take that calling back. And in Romans 11 verse 29 it says, For God's gifts and His call are irrevocable. If you look at the message, it says God's gifts and God's call are under full warranty. How many of you, when you buy something expensive, you want to know what is the warranty? The first thing people look for when they buy a car, what is the warranty? The first thing people look at when they buy an expensive TV or a nice fridge or something like that, what is the warranty? God's gifts and His call are under full warranty, never cancelled, never rescinded. How long does this warranty last? Well, as long as you are alive. It's a lifetime warranty. Tell the person next to you, say, I want that lifetime warranty. Tell them, I'm, I'm excited about the lifetime warranty. If you're married, you can tell your spouse, I have a lifetime warranty on my life. doesn't matter if you think I'm the worst person on the face of the planet. I have a lifetime warranty from Jesus. Amen. Come on, can we give the Lord Jesus a big round of applause for that? Amen. And the gifts of God can never be taken away from you. The call of God can never be taken away from you. It's irrevocable. That means it cannot be cancelled. There's no cancel culture in heaven. There's no cancel culture in heaven. And what this means is that the gift and the calling that God has placed on your life cannot be rescinded. Rescinded means it's withdrawn. It cannot be. Because God has decreed it. It means God's gifts and calling on your life are there permanently. He's never going to take them back. He will never ever take those, those gifts and those callings back. And the, the warranty is given is a full warranty. You know, normally the warranties we get got terms and conditions. You think you got a warranty and then they come and they say, no, no, you, you broke the conditions of the warranty. The, the warranty is now null and void. This warranty is based on the terms and conditions that Jesus died on the cross for you. And it will never be rescinded, which means there's no terms and conditions unless you reject the warranty.
What this means is it'll work or the, or the Lord will give you your money back. Come on, tell the person next to you that. That sounds like a good deal to me. It'll work or the Lord will give you your money back. That's what a warranty means. It'll work. You're not getting your money back because it was Jesus' money that the gift was paid for. Amen? Now God is waiting to make, to make you the child in His glorious presence. Back to Romans 11, verse 30. Just as you at one time were disobedient to God and now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, you were disobedient to God. Don't come and act like you all that. You were disobedient to God. So now they too have become disobedient in order that they too might receive the mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience that He might have mercy on them all. There's no one here that's too good. Everyone needs mercy. And everyone is bound to evil so that many are not doing the Bible. If you're not doing the Bible, you're bound to evil. Now, why has God given you mercy? The only reason God has given you mercy is because you were disobedient. If you were not disobedient, God wouldn't need to give you mercy. Mercy is needed because you were disobedient. Israel became disobedient, which placed them in the same boat as us, in need of mercy. Who can receive mercy? Every single person that was disobedient. So if you've been disobedient, you can receive mercy. Now God gives us this mercy in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. And it says there, So great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. Do, do you realize how much God loves you? That in spite of your sin and in spite of your disobedience, He wants to lavish upon you. Lavish means give extravagantly, give over an abundance. He wants to lavish upon you the title that you are the child of God. The vision of God for you, the vision of God for me, the vision of God for His church is that He will lavish upon us the title child of God. If you have the title child of God, what that means is that you are going to inherit everything that God owns. It means that you're put on an equal footing in a way with Jesus. This is why another place the Bible says we are heirs of the Father. An heir means you're going to inherit everything the Father owns. And therefore, because of that, we are joint heirs with the Son. That's why Jesus came and died for you. So that you can get to a place where you can become a joint heir with Him. Basically what the Lord wants is to be able to have a relationship with you for the rest of eternity. Where He can genuinely call you His friend. That's why Jesus died for you. And He did it for Himself. And then it says, and that is what we are. If you believe in Jesus, that's exactly what, we, what you are. You are a child of God. And it says the reason the world does not know us is that it does not know Him. Many people hate Christians. Many people hate the church because they do not know Jesus. Do not be surprised when you see the amount of hatred lavished towards the church from the world because the world doesn't know Jesus. Verse 2 says, Dear friends, now that we are children of God and what we will be has not yet be, been made known. So if the first thing there is, we are children of God, but what we're going to be one day in glory has not yet been made known. We're not yet all that God's going to make us in the future through our faith. We're, we're not living for now. We're living for eternity. We're living for the forever time. 
we're living for the time when God is going to re- reveal in us all of His glory. He's going to reveal all of His glory to all of creation through us. We're not there yet. But then He says this, But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So when Jesus comes back, we're going to be like Him. And then it says, why are we going to be like Him? We're going to be like Him because we're going to see Him as He is. So here's an important thing. Tell the person next to you, say, here's an important thing. The more you see Jesus as He is, the more you will be like Jesus. When you see Jesus as He is, Jesus is so awesome. Jesus is so incredible. Jesus is someone that is indescribable. He is more exciting than than the greatest celebrity that you can go after. When you see Jesus as He really is, you will be like Him. If you're not like Jesus, there's something wrong with your spiritual vision. You do not see Jesus. The greatest thing that you have to know today as you're sitting here in this service is that at the end of the day, you need to to see Jesus if you want to become like Jesus. You need to see Him for who He is. You need to see Him for how much He loves you. you. You need to see Him for how much He suffered for you on the cross and how bad your sin actually was that Jesus had to go through all of those gruesome things for you. This is why we encourage you every day when you get up, Spend time with the Lord and have an encounter with Jesus. And understand what it is that He went through on the cross for you. Because when you see Jesus as He is, you'll be like Him. Now while all the fullness of this will only happen one day in eternity, we can have more and more of that now here on this earth. We can become more and more like Jesus every single day on this earth. And let me tell you something. For those of you, maybe there's one or two here that think it's boring to be like Jesus. You know nothing. You know nothing. The stuff of this world, the the most exciting things in this world are boring compared to Jesus. There is nothing like Jesus. Nothing even comes close. And then it says in verse 3, All who have this hope in Him, this hope that one day we're going to be just like Jesus. One day we're going to look exactly like Him. This hope, that's hope. All who have this hope in Him, because He's the one that does it. So if we believe this, we have this hope in Jesus. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. How do you become pure? When you really have that hope. When you really, really, really rest everything that you know on that hope that one day He's going to make you exactly like Him. So if you don't have the hope, you're not pure. If you don't have the hope, you start praying that God will give you the hope. And then it goes on and it says the the alternative in verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. So everyone who sins breaks the law. Every time you lie, every time you steal, whatever, whatever it may be, you break the law. And then it says, sin is lawlessness. Now what happens when there's lawlessness? People get hurt. See, law is a good thing. Law and order is a good thing. When there's lawlessness, people get hurt. And by the way, lawlessness includes from the leaders. If there's lawlessness amongst the leaders of a nation or the leaders of a company or whatever, people get hurt. But you know that He appeared so that He might take away our sins. Jesus appeared to take your sin away. The reason Jesus came is to take your sin away. The whole reason that Jesus lived on this earth was to take your sin away. And then it says, and in Him there is no sin. In Jesus there is no sin. Why was Jesus able to die for our sins? Because in Him there is no sin. And so sin is supposed to be a payment for, uh, sorry, death is supposed to be a payment for sin. Hell is supposed to be the payment for sin. But Jesus paid that price when He never sinned. So what is God doing? 
He's looking for all your and my sins to put onto Jesus to justify the death of Jesus. That's how God stays just. He's still a God of justice, yet at the same time, He's a God of mercy. Because how can you say you're a just person if you show mercy to the, to the rapist? You can't. Either there's justice, the rapist must pay, or there's mercy. But God did both. Then he says this in verse 6, and I want you to listen very carefully to this. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. This is a challenge. Are you keeping on sinning? You, you, you need to see more of Jesus. You need to spend more time with Jesus. Because no one, who, no one who's in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Sin's only attractive if you don't know Jesus. Once you know Jesus, sin sucks. You hate sin. Sin, you know, even, even if you do sin, it feels flat and it feels empty. When you've seen Jesus, you don't want that. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. How, how do you get to that place? You've got to know Jesus. You've got to get close to him. And I want you really to think about this because God gives His glorious love that is lavished on us. Think about it, that we are saved so that we can inherit the right to be called the children of God. And when you become someone who can be called the child of God, yes, the devil hates you. He hates your guts. Why? Because he hates Jesus. But Jesus has overcome the devil. The devil can't touch you where Jesus won't allow him. I want to tell you something about the devil. The devil can only hurt you if you open the door to him. If you keep looking at Jesus and if you see Jesus, that door remains closed. As God's child, there's an incredible thing that you're allowed. You're allowed into the presence of God. You're allowed to walk right into His throne room at any time. And all you need to do is when you, when you walk into the throne room, it's when you're praying and you pray in Jesus' name. The moment you pray in Jesus' name, you can walk into the throne room of God anytime you want. Anytime. About anything. Even if what you're asking for is nonsense. Because that's what a child is allowed to do with their father, when they have a father that loves them. They come into that room anytime and ask daddy for anything. Why? Because daddy loves them and they abuse that love. When last did you abuse the love of God for you? Write that down. So when last did I abuse the love of God for me? When we believe this promise, we build our lives on the hope of Jesus reappearing. Which is the hope that purifies us. Now I become pure because of my hope which is in Jesus. That's all I need to do to be pure. I need to put my hope in Jesus. Not, don't, tell the person next to you, say, don't put your hope in the dope. Amen. Say, so put your hope in Jesus. There's a warning. You cannot be born again and keep on sinning. The grace of God allows you to overpower your sin. Do the God thing. Now here's the thing. Here's the important thing. And this is what I want you to realize today. You can't, you can't, you can't be like Jesus out of your own strength. You've got to do it in His strength. You've got to learn to walk in the strength of God. And I want to just mention what it means when you've repented. When you've repented means you've changed your mind. You no longer want to live like that. So now you start changing. Now the change is a process. It happens over time. But if you don't want to change, there's a problem. 
And so I'm asking you today, have you gotten to the point where you want to change? If you've gotten to the point where you want to change, all you have to start learning to do is to learn how to walk in the strength of God, the supernatural strength of God, because it isn't, it isn't in your power to be right. It isn't in your power to be perfect. But here's the thing. God has the strength available that you will change. You will become what God created you to be. And I'm going to ask you all right now to close your eyes. And I want you to think about where you stand with the Lord. If you haven't even decided that you want to change. Then it means you haven't repented. Because repent means you want to change. Repent means that everything inside of you wants to change. That's what repent means. So as you're sitting there today, I'm asking you, what have you done with the Lord? What have you done with Jesus? The place where we're at right now is an altar before Almighty God. God wants to touch you. But in order for that to become real for you, you've got to receive Jesus. And what does the Bible say if you receive Jesus? If you receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, then what happens is that you end up in a place whereby He gives you the Holy Spirit. He gives you the Holy Spirit. And what does the Bible say in Romans 8 verse 11 about the Holy Spirit? It says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. In other words, if you receive Jesus... One day, you're going to overcome death because you're going to be raised from the dead. That is what it means. And Romans chapter 10 verse 8 and 9 says this, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. The stuff that I've been speaking about is the word of faith. It's a word which where you put your faith in Jesus. You believe in Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus... He comes into your life. He washes all your sin away. He gives you the Holy Spirit. And He begins to teach you how to change. He begins to teach you what it means to be pure. And He begins to give you a supernatural strength. strength and he, he allows you and He shows you how to lean on the strength of the Holy Spirit so that your life changes. And then how do you get saved? That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. So I want to tell you today, your eternal destiny is at stake. Your eternal destiny is at stake. You're going to end up somewhere for eternity. And so maybe you're sitting here and you're struggling. You're saying, no, no, I'm not ready. Maybe, maybe I'm going to make a commitment for Jesus later. I'm going to say to you, no that you come right now. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and I'm going to ask you all to stand. And I want you to think about where you stand with Jesus right now. Everyone stand. And I want you to think about where you stand with Jesus right now. And I want you to realize this place here in front here is an altar. Right now it's an altar. And I want you just to close your eyes and I want you to picture Jesus standing in front of you because this altar makes everything righteous. This altar makes everything pure. This altar makes everything sanctified. It is Jesus. It is what He did for you on the cross. Don't think that you're going to have a more effective prayer time later because now is the time. And if you come forward, then, then what you're saying to God is you're saying, Lord, now is my time. Lord, I can't wait. 
I can't wait until later. Lord, I want to commit to you right now. Lord, I want to commit my life completely to you right now. Lord, I can't wait until I get home. Lord, because if I wait until I get home, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Lord, I want to do it now because I want to know that from today, when I walk out of this place, that I'm going to be walking with you. And I want to know that I'm walking with you because I don't want to live eternity far from you. I want to live eternity with you. I want to live close to you from this day on. I want to live close to you because I want to know that when the time comes for me to die, that it won't affect me. Because I'll know that you're right there with me. And so I want to invite you right now. As the worship team sings, if you need to make a commitment to Jesus for the first time, maybe you've never committed to Him before, or if you need to recommit your life to Jesus, maybe you were committed to Him and you're listening to a passage from John and it, it tells you what it means to be saved. It tells you that if you've been enjoying your sin, there's a problem. If you make a mistake and you believe in Jesus, the mistake's going to freak you out and you're going to run to Jesus. He's the first place you're going to run to. Before anyone else even knows, you're going to run to Him because you don't want that. You don't want to do that. If you're enjoying your sin, I'm going to encourage you to come forward. Because that is a sign that you need to recommit your life to Jesus. And you need to change your mind about this stuff. And I know there are people here today. I know that I sense it in my spirit that there are people here today and you need to make this commitment before the Lord. Either a first time commitment or recommitment to Jesus here today. Because He's been speaking to you in the service. And what I want to tell you is that the speaking that He's been doing is the Holy Spirit that has been speaking the Word of God directly to you. God Himself has been speaking to you. And so don't wait another day because one or two of you, this might be the last opportunity you'll ever have to give your life to Jesus. Because the Bible says that Satan is controlling the world and he's controlling the minds of the people that are in the world. And God has had to peel away all of that deception in order for the message of his truth to get through to you today. And God might be saying to you, if you don't give your life today, you'll never have this opportunity again. So make today the day that you do it. And so as we sing this song, just come forward. Those of you needing to, re to, to commit or, or recommit their life to Jesus, just come forward right now. We want to pray with you. And so start coming forward right now in Jesus' name. If you were to die today, do you know that you'd meet God today? Or do you not know that you'd be right with God? If, if you don't know, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Maybe you're standing here today and there is sin that is just overwhelming you. You're just crushed with guilt and you think you could never be right with the Lord. There is no sin that you could have committed from which you cannot be saved by the blood of Jesus. The price for the blood of Jesus is far greater than the price for your sin. You cannot out -sin the blood of Jesus. As I said, 
I just really feel this strong on my heart right now. If the Lord has been speaking to you and you're thinking you'll do this later, you need to come forward right now. You haven't seen it before. Because the enemy has closed your mind and God is saying to you, and I really believe there's someone here God is speaking to you. He's been speaking to you. I just feel it very strongly that if you don't come, you'll never have this opportunity again. Today is the day of your salvation. And if, you, if you're standing here and you feel like, you know what, your life doesn't matter. Jesus died for you. Your life matters so much that He died on the cross for you. Your life matters so much that blood was shed from His feet for you, for your purpose, for the reason why you're alive. There is more value in your life than what you could ever know. And so if there's any person like that, God's saying, come forward. I want, I want to have an encounter with you right now because I want you to know this. And I want you just to think about the words of the song that we sang earlier, which they sang now. Sprinkled with your blood. We've been offered mercy. Your unconditional love hits me like a flood through the blood of Jesus. So one last time, if there's anyone else, just come forward now. And just to mention anyone that's watching online, please send an email to info at activechurch.org. That's info at activechurch.org. If you're making this decision right now, it's important that you get to us. We'll contact you because we never make this decision alone. We make it in public. And so those of you that have come forward, I'm going to ask everyone else just to raise your hands towards the people that have come forward. I'm going to ask you to place your right hand on your heart right now. And I want you to see Jesus standing before you right now. He died for you on the cross. I want you to see Him pouring out every drop of His blood for you. Every single drop. That's how much He loved you. That's how much He loves you even today. And the Bible says that this Jesus that you're looking at in front of you right now is the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. His love for you hasn't changed. And the same Jesus who died for you over 2,000 years ago on the cross, His blood is washing away your sin right now by your act of faith. I don't care what you've done. It's washing it away. And I'm asking God to give you the faith inside of you by the Holy Spirit right now to believe that, to see that. The blood that Jesus shed was the price that He paid to wash all your sin away. And so we're all going to pray together with you, but you mean this prayer, and the Lord's going to do something incredible in your life. Amen. Let's just pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, today I recognize that I'm a sinner. I repent of everything that I've done wrong. I renounce my life of sin and I accept your sacrifice and I know that it was the price that you paid for my redemption and today Lord I ask that the blood of your wounded body would wash me of all rebellion and all my sin I pray that you'd set me free of any sickness and any pain as I accept Lord that my debt has been paid. There is no outstanding balance. You paid everything for me on the cross of Calvary. And I accept that by your blood, I am justified. And that by this blood, you see me as I've never sinned. And that by your blood, I am sanctified. And you have chosen me to serve you. And Lord, I'm willing to serve you. And so today, I open the door of my heart and I invite you to come in as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me and for giving me eternal life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning.
Good morning and welcome to Are You Up Babes? I'm really very honored this morning to be having Melanie Enslin, who is my mother-in-law, with us. And I know many of you know her and cherish her. She is such an incredible person and it is my privilege and honor to have her on Are You Up Babes? And this morning we're going to be looking at being a house goddess. Yes, a house goddess. And you know, as women, we have so many responsibilities um, as wives, um, in our home, keeping up our home, being good moms, um, work actually having work on the forefront, ministry, and how do we win in all these tasks? So this morning, my mom-in-law is going to give us really valuable, godly advice on how we can win at being a house goddess. Yeah. 